Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. As we end the year of 2021, and also the fifth year of Gospel Tangents, I wanted to look back at some of the influential Mormon historians and people in the Mormon community that we've lost. So, uh, over this next episode, we're going to talk about five main people. Um, we'll start with Armand Moss, um, Michael Quinn, Pat, uh, not Pat Bagley, his brother, Will Bagley, Shannon Flynn, and Kurt Bench. So um, these are some pillars in the Mormon historians community. And, um, you know, we've been talking with uh, the late Dr. John Pratt. I thought it would only be appropriate to talk about some of the other people that we've lost um, this year. So I'd like to start with Armand Moss. Unfortunately, Armand never actually appeared on Gospel Tangents, but... Uh, uh, he did write a chapter in Newell Bringhurst and Matt um, Harris's book, and so Matt, we're gonna. Ha I'm gonna introduce Matt and Newell to talk about uh, Armand here in uh, just a moment. But I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about Armand. I'm pulling this mostly from Wikipedia because it's a nice, quick, easy source. But uh, just to tell you a little bit about Armand. Armand Lind Moss was born June 5th, 1928, in Salt Lake City, Utah. He was a lifelong member of the church and served a full-time mission for the church in New England. In 1949, he accompanied his family to Japan, where his father was called to preside over missionary work of the LDS Church in East Asia. While in Japan, he was also inducted into the U.S. Air Force, serving four years in military intelligence. In 1950, he met Ruth Hathaway, and they married in 1951. In 1954, Moss graduated from Sophia University in Tokyo, a distinguished Jesuit institution with a BA in Asian Studies and History. Uh, he and his wife are the parents of six sons and two daughters. Moss joined the faculty at Utah State University for two years. In 1970, he earned a PhD in Sociology with a dissertation titled Mormonism and Minorities at the University of California at Berkeley. He moved on to sociology faculty at Washington State University, where he taught for three decades, starting in 1969 and formally retiring in 1999. Moss specialized in the sociology of religion. In 2013, Claremont Graduate University honored him as one of the most prominent Mormon intellectuals of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. He received three different awards from the Mormon History Association for his books, and other works, and two awards from the Dialogue Foundation for his articles in Dialogue. Moss served 20 years on its editorial and advisory boards, and then 10 years as either chairman or a member of the Dialogue Foundation's board of directors. Moss was president of the Mormon History Association from 1997 to 1998. I just wanted to include some of his uh, most famous books, uh, Neither Black Nor White, Mormon Scholars Encounter the Race Issue. Um, that was published in 1984 by Signature Books. The Angel and the Beehive, The Mormon Struggle with Assimilation. That was published by the University of Illinois Press in 1994. All Abraham's Children, Changing Conceptions of Race and Lineage. That was also published by University of Illinois Press in April of 2003. And Shifting Borders and a Tattered Passport. Intellectual Journeys of a Mormon Academic, which was published by University of Utah Press. Armand passed away on August 1st, 2020. Um, as I mentioned, he wrote a chapter in Newell Bringhurst and Matt Harris's book on the Gospel Topics series that was actually published after his death uh, here in 2021. Kind of why I wanted to include him in here. And so I just wanted to uh, let Matt and Newell share their thoughts of, of uh, and memories of, of Moss or, or of Armand Moss here. So I'll turn it over to them. I would like to talk a little bit about um, Armand Moss, who just recently passed away. Um, can you guys share a little bit about what Armand said to, to kind of close up the book? Uh yeah, I, I, I thought that uh, that essay is really one of the critical essays. If I was going to recommend uh, the way you read the book, I would, I would recommend uh, reading uh, the introduction that Matt and I wrote and then going to uh, read what uh, Armand Moss had to say in his, uh, in his concluding essay, because what that does 
is it really does two critical things. It, it kind of summarizes the gist of what's in most of the essays so that if you read, if you read, if you read that second, you'd be able to go back and read the, each of the uh, you know, subsequent you know, uh, essays themselves. And, and he does really a good job of, of, of summarizing the gist of what each of the authors mean and, and how, they, how they approached it. And, uh, and, and so I think that's one of the great contributions of his uh, essay. But I thought one of the most profound things that, uh, that Armin had to say in his, uh, his uh, essay, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to look through my notes because I, I thought it was so, so uh, kind of profound that it, it, uh, it, it, it stood out at me, uh, uh, was uh, he talks about, uh, there's a section of his, of, of his uh, commentary where he talks about the evolution of church uh, doctrines and categories of church doctrine, he 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 breaks it down. I think he's written this in other other contexts, but he says that uh, when you're dealing with the issue of church doctrines and how they change, they tend to fall in four uh, you know four categories: canonical, which is the highest level, things that really are 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 very strong and basic to to essential Mormonism what are called official, which is a second category, the third category being authoritative, and then uh, uh, the lowest category, what he calls folklore. And uh, it, it's interesting because he does say that the, the evolution, you know, uh, like the black priesthood uh, and temple restriction kind of went through all four of these categories, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Bert, I don't know if he, he, he says, you know, it starts out as folklore and then it evolves into authoritative, you know, when, when, when Joseph, when Brigham Young, uh, you know, issues, uh, saying blacks can all, uh, authoritative, uh, official when it's in blacks can no longer, uh, hold the priesthood. And then it almost reaches a canonical, uh, category when the church issues its official uh, uh, statements first in 1949, which really gives it the imprimatur of the first presidency. And, it, and, and it's really enforced. I mean, people who, who question it or, or try to change it are, are, are really dealt with harshly, you know, really from that point on, before it, it, it doesn't have that canonical uh, category. And so, uh, you know, that, uh, so he, he, he discusses that in this uh, concluding essay. And then he also deals with what, uh, uh, what he calls issues of doctrinal innovation. For instance, he, he looks at the essay that uh, was written on the mother in heaven. Initially, that was a taboo to even talk about uh, you know, a mother in heaven. I mean, that was one of the things that got people like Margaret Toscano and others, you know, when they did the purge in the early 90s, you know, all those women were talking about uh, female feminist issues, including mother in heaven. And there was a, an explicit ban at that time that you do not, you know, that's not even brought up as an issue. But the fact that, uh, that uh, the church has issued a mother in heaven uh, uh, essay has uh, removed that taboo and perhaps moved it in, you know, from maybe what had been the folklore, or, or, you know, uh, an official category. But yet it's still kind of tricky because uh, the church is very uncomfortable about the idea of, you know, you know uh, uh, talking excessively and in detail uh, uh, about mother in heaven. So he, he talks about the idea of, uh, of, of, of doctrinal uh, innovation as reflected in some of the essays, particularly the mother in heaven essay. And then uh, even in the Bloomberg uh, essay, he makes reference to the fact that uh, uh, the church has, uh, has kind of moved in what one, I think it was one writer named White who talked about a neo-orthodoxy of the church, giving increased emphasis to the idea of grace works and uh, the sufficiency of the atonement, which uh, Bloomberg, you know, discusses in his essay. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and then he also deals with the issue of, uh, of ambiguity, 
what did Joseph Smith really mean when he wrote about women's role in the priesthood? And, and that was an issue that, uh, that Margaret Toscano uh, tackles in the, uh, you know, and I think you'll find your interview with her quite interesting how she'll, she'll handle that. I'm sure she'll have some really interesting things to say about what did Joseph Smith really mean when he talks about the women's role in the priesthood. And, and Margaret is absolutely convinced that he intended that the Relief Society would be another priesthood quorum, just as the, uh, uh, the quorum of the anointed. He claims that Margaret, uh, you know, uh, uh, claims or, or, and others have written that the Quorum of the Anointed was considered as a priesthood quorum. And that was a quorum that included both men and women. So she's effectively arguing that women <laughs> held uh, the priesthood. So, you know, as I say, um, Armand has some really fascinating things to say uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the way he, uh, summarizes and encapsulations the significance of the uh, of, of of the gospel topics essays and what they portend for you know doesn't doesn't go into it too much but what it maybe portends for the future of the church. Cool. Do you have anything else, Matt, on on Armin Moss and the and the conclusion there? No, Noel summarized it nicely. Just I'd say one thing about Armin the person though is that I think that there isn't probably anybody in the church, in my opinion, who represents a um, honesty and truthfulness, and but yet from a believing Latter-day Saint as Armin. He really has walked that balance his entire life. He's not afraid of the truth. He's not afraid to uh, let the chips fall where they may. But as a believing, practicing Mormon, um, I always, I loved his scholarship because I knew that he wasn't an apologist. I knew that he wasn't going to um, whitewash, you know, race or anything else he wrote about. And he was always going to do it in a very sensitive uh, way that I think is really what should be expected of each of us who, who writes on Mormon studies. And I, I really think he's a model of a believer, but also a scholar. And that's one of the reasons why Newell and I wanted him to participate in this volume is because he really did have that, that balance and um, he's going to be missed. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. He was, I, I consider him to have been a personal mentor to me because he carefully critiqued and uh, uh, went over with me. And we had a lot of lively discussions on uh, the issue of blacks and the priesthood because along with Lester Bush, Armin was one of the pioneer writers on the issue of race uh, priesthood. His first article appeared before uh, Lester Bush's did back in back in the 1970s, 70, uh, uh, or 67. It was a, a dialogue article on race, folklore, and, and and the priesthood. He he. So he talks a little bit about how uh, how it started out as folklore. You know that 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 was his his, uh, you know, initial foray. And then of course, all of Abraham's children. And then he and Lester Bush uh, co-edited uh, an anthology, which included one of my essays in there on, uh, that was published in, uh, in the early 1980s. Neither white nor Matt's, black, there it is. That's right holding there. it up. I don't know if we can see it, but hopefully you can. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, neither white nor black. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, he continued to write on the issue. And then, you know, he, the fading of the Pharaoh's curse is another very seminal article where he further argues about this evolution going from folklore uh, uh, to, uh, to doctrine, you know, to a can canonical. Uh, I mean, you, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, you have to acknowledge the fact that it, that, that the black, that uh, black priesthood denial reached the canonical status with the 49th statement. And then it's almost like they immediately regretted it because <laughs> come, here comes David O. McKay saying, oh my gosh, I signed this statement back in 49 and they tried to downplay that they'd even, that statement even existed as, as Matt has shown in the stuff that he's written. I mean, it was, you know, they, they, they give it that status and then almost immediately 
uh, when when David O takes so David O McKay takes over in fifty one, he said, "Oh my gosh, look what we're stuck with. We're stuck with this damn albatross, you know." <laughs> and and I think that's what he, you know, uh, almost at, at you know David O McKay is another complex individual. I I, I had the opportunity to get to know the McKay family. Uh, quite intimately when I was doing my biography of Fawn Brody, who, of course, oh, wow. was McKay's uh, errant niece. So, right. you know, they're an interesting family, uh, you know, kind of have some of the same complexities and contradictions that you find with Dallin Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with uh, Matt Harris and Newell Bringhurst discussing uh, Armin Moss. So it's a great loss to the Mormon historians community that we've lost Armin, and I just wanted to remember him. In our next conversation, we're going to look back on the life of D. Michael Quinn and uh, talk about him in our next conversation. Could the church be accused of serving God and mammon, though, with some of these businesses? The accusation is there, but typically it comes from people who don't recognize that the church makes no distinction between God and mammon. <laughs> If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents, and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just click the yellow subscribe button, and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.